Well, thank you, everybody. Hope you don't mind me looking at you over here. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that y'all are having a really wonderful session. Um, I didn't know if I'd be able to see the audience. So now that I can, um, so what's the general profile here? Can you raise your hand if you are a systems engineer? Everybody, huh? except for the mask dude. Um, and uh, what do you do? Do you do, uh, I wonder if I'll be able to hear. Um, do you do development? Operations, cool, very nice, all right. So, well, thank you everybody for joining uh, my session, DBA Tools for Systems Engineers and Accidental DBAs. My name is Chrissy Lemaire. I am a dual Microsoft MVP awarded for my work in both SQL Server and PowerShell, and I'm also a GitHub star. And I'm also the former DBA at NATO Special Ops Headquarters. Now, do a lot of security work and I use PowerShell to secure machines and automate all of that. But whenever I was at NATO Special Ops, um, as, I, as I built out all of my SQL servers, I actually kept in mind that whenever I left, I probably wouldn't be backfilled by a DBA, but rather a systems engineer. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and this presentation is actually based off of the documentation that I left for the systems engineer, uh, Joe Warren. I've met him at PS ConfiU, which was really cool. And then we ended up working together. Um, and I was very proud that when he received the docs, he actually said, oh my God, this is overwhelming. And that was a source of pride because usually you're left without any documentation um, and then you have to figure out everything for yourself. So. Based off of this, I wanted to give my buddy a really great jump start with SQL Server and I um, wanted to give that to you all as well. We have a book about DBA tools coming out soon. Finally, it's going to be, re be released on June 7th. This book um, has been in the works since uh, January 2019. We're very excited about it. Just got it typeset and to actually see it, it looks like a real book. We are super pumped. And if you haven't bought the book and you're interested, um, this code has worked for years. It's BLDBA Tools 50, and this will get you 50% off of your purchase. You get at dbatools.io slash book is the short link. I love short links. There's gonna be a lot of short links throughout this presentation. So I am on Twitter. You can follow me. I talk about PowerShell and SQL Server. Um, I am at CL. If you have any questions that you forget to ask during this session or after the session, um, you can hit me up there. DBA Tools is also on Twitter at PSDBA Tools. The poor guy that has the at DBA Tools handle gets pinged all the time. Um, he hasn't been around since like 2012, but DBA Tools is on Twitter and there we also um, mostly retweet about PowerShell and SQL Server. So today I'm going to be talking about PowerShell, uh, sorry, about DBA tools. And who in the room has used DBA tools or is familiar with DBA tools? Not that many, okay. So DBA tools, it's the community module for SQL Server. Microsoft has one. I'm not, I don't really love it. It, it has limited functionality and I find that it's a bit rigid. Um, with DBA tools, we have a bunch of combo commands that are really impressive. Processes that used to take two months of planning are just done in mere seconds now or actually minutes. Um, there are now 225 contributors to our repo. Uh, there's a huge community to actually help support um, the tool set. So if you go to uh, dbatools.io slash Slack, join the DBA Tools channel, you can get tech support there, which is pretty cool. We have about 1.5 million downloads on, um, on the PowerShell gallery. So it's a pretty popular tool set and it's very thoroughly tested by both Pester within our repository and also by the community as well. So when it comes to support, it's very important for me um, to support older versions of things. And that's because like we may want to work with cutting edge stuff. We may wanna work with PowerShell version seven, but it's just not possible in our environment. 
So I tried to go back as far as reasonable with PowerShell 3. It's fun to program for, unlike PowerShell 2, which was a lot more restrictive. I and mean, then it works all the way back to Windows 7, which is nice. And then I think that's uh, Windows Server 2008. Also, we support all the way back to SQL Server 2000, and that is because Microsoft makes it possible with their SQL Server API called SMO, or SQL Management Objects. So as long as they're supporting it, we're supporting it as well. We always test on the newest versions. We do support some Azure and also SQL on Linux, which is just phenomenal in the feature parity with SQL on Windows. Uh, when it comes to like running DBA tools against that server, you can run it from Windows, Linux, Mac OS, Docker, Raspberry Pi, Apple M1, and that's because PowerShell is available on all of these platforms, and also um, SMO is available as well. That's the core version um, that's available on Raspberry Pi, Apple, Docker, Linux, etc. In addition, you don't have to have Enterprise Edition. That's the super expensive one. Uh, we support every version possible, all the way from Express to Enterprise, and then also local DB as well. We support clustered and standalone instances. As uh, systems engineers, I would hope that you're probably not supporting clustered instances, but if you are, then uh, we program for those as well. And we also support Windows SQL and Azure authentication. Essentially, um, the tool that is generally used with SQL Server is called SQL Server Management Studio or SSMS. And what I did was I took the little drop down and looked at everything that was available and then made sure that all of those methods worked on DBA tools as well. We also support default and named instances. So a default instance is when you connect to a host name and it's right there at port 1433, which is the default port, that is called a default instance. And then you have a named instance. So let's say you're connecting to SQL 01, that's default. If you put that slash SQL Express, then that's called a named instance. And we support that as well. If you have a named instance, you will need to use SQL Server Browser. That service on Windows will have to be running uh, for it to be detected because it appears on an alternate port. And also, if you are running multiple instances on one server, so if you stack it, this isn't my favorite thing to do. I don't recommend it. I don't like it. It makes things a little bit uh, rougher. Some DBAs really love it because it reduces their server footprint, like, at, like Windows Server. Um, and if you are using multiple instances on one server, we support that as well. So when it comes to installing, uh, to install it, you just install module DBA tools. That'll go and grab it from the PowerShell gallery. And a lot of people always ask us, where should this be installed? And the assumption is that it's going to be installed on all of the SQL servers. But in fact, what we like to do is have a centralized management server. You put SQL Server Management Studio on there, you put DBA tools on there, and then from there, you remote out to others. Um, there is an exception. If you are running a SQL agent job, that's like the task scheduler of SQL Server. If you're running that, then you will wanna make sure that DBA tools um, is installed for all users. And that way the service account can actually access DBA tools. And in my environment where I had 40 SQL servers, I had probably two on each side. Uh, so there were 20 and there were two that actually had DBA tools installed. And when it comes to documentation, I was actually watching a DBA tools presentation on uh, YouTube the other day. And I was really proud because the person really emphasized just how thorough our docs are. So we have docs in, um, uh, in PowerShell itself. And anytime that you commit a new command to our repository, we actually run pester tests 
to ensure that there's you know, the synopsis description that all the parameters have documentation. We worked really hard to standardize our documentation. There's also uh, examples and everything like that. And if you left out any of that when contributing, then that test will fail and then you'll have to add it in. And then we use GitHub Actions to take that documentation from the DBA Tools module and then build our website at docs.dbatools.io. Uh, it was really cool. We have a lot of different background, people with different backgrounds that are contributing. So with our docs website, we, we have somebody who knows SQL Server, PowerShell, and JavaScript. So we have a lot of JavaScript magic on there. But on the team, we have people who are experts in C Sharp, in PowerShell, in specific like features within SQL Server, like say replication, um, the backup and restore, which can get pretty hairy. And then also things like log shipping or availability groups, et cetera. So it's really cool that, uh, that we get so much talent from the entire community within DBA tools. So um, this is our flagship command. It's called start DBA migration. And what I'm about to show you is just a little quick video of a migration with a, from a SharePoint instance. And this is actually where everything started from. I was working at NATO Special Ops and they're like, hey, we're going to have to migrate the SQL server uh, for SharePoint. And I was like, oh my God, that's so many databases. That's so many logins. It's so many jobs. And the whole task was really exhausting. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm sure that somebody did this in PowerShell and it hadn't happened then. Um, so that was a really great opportunity to make a very tedious and long process uh, way more fun. And so this is the command that pretty much started it all. So here we have this instance with just a ton of logins, databases, jobs. It's just totally stacked. This is SQL Server Management Studio. And then this is just like a default instance with no data databases and the default logins. So you execute start DBA migration, you spe specify your source, your destination, your migration method, and then the network share, which is now called shared path. And then this is, it, it migrates this entire thing, right? We have SP configure, which is like the configuration settings. We have all the database backups. We have the logins with all of their properties, including passwords, default database, things like that. We have all of the SQL agent jobs, it's really, really incredible and time. I've used this so many times. And what's really awesome about it is that after, like while you're running it, you could just kick back because we had a whole bunch of DBAs who put in all of the effort and we codified our knowledge so that you can relax. And a lot of times when I would do these migrations, if I knew that they would take a little while, I would like go grocery shopping and, and then come back. And that was always fun. And one of the biggest compliments that I got was from our storage administrator. We were 20 minutes into a migration and he's like, hey, Chrissy, why is it taking so long? And I was like, that's amazing. Like that your expectation is so high for an entire instance to instance migration. I absolutely love that. And the answer, why was it taking so long? It's because the databases just happened to be bigger. So they had to uh, you know, there was more to back up and restore. So I want to go over some of the top concerns for non-DBAs. The first thing that you're going to want to do is ensure that your backups are running. Like as soon as you inherit a SQL server, make sure that's happening. And pay particular attention to log backups, because if you do not back up your log files, or your, yes, if you don't back up your logs, then it's actually just going to grow and grow and grow literally forever because unless it's in simple recovery mode, um, and that's not really a guarantee, um, but with full, it's just going to keep that and it'll grow until you run out of disk space and then you expand it and then it will continue to grow and then you'll run out again. This is something that catches people all the time. So you will be tempted. I mean, like whenever I first um, started, this is true for me as well. Whenever I first started as a DBA, I was like, man, this thing is just like growing. And then what should I do? Like, should I regularly shrink this database? And that is the temptation is because, you know, you'll look up giant SQL server log, how to shrink. 
and you'll find a lot of ways to do it, but you don't want to because when you shrink that database, first of all, it's just going to grow again, but it's also going to cause a lot of fragmentation. So we actually have a command that automates shrinking the database because there are some instances where you have to, but we do put some notes in there that let you know um, that it could be causing some fragmentation. So don't do this. So tempting. It happens even with seasoned DBAs too. The next thing that you're going to want to do is perform database integrity checks because you can have a database that is corrupt but still running. And there are times when if it's too corrupt, the only way to recover is to restore a backup. So you want to catch this as early as possible. You also want to check your disk space. So you want to make sure that there's enough disk space for your databases to grow. But if you are backing up to your NAS, you also want to make sure that that has an adequate amount of space as well. And one of the first things that I always check for are failed agent jobs. So SQL Server agent, um, it's a scheduler. I consider them like scheduled tasks. And um, you want to make sure that when you inherit something, like if, if you inherit something and it's already failing, then you can manage those expectations. If you check it months later, you don't know if it started failing on your watch and then you have to figure out how to reverse engineer it. So that's something that I always check um, to make sure. And there are some times where I have inherited a machine and there were failed jobs, but it's expected to fail because the application changed, but the job wasn't made aware of it. And so from there, I usually, I don't delete the jobs, but I do disable them um, so that they just stop reporting as failed. And what's really cool, you might be, uh, tempted to make changes to a database because somebody's like, hey, I really need you to add something to the table. But I use this all the time. Um, making changes to vendor, to, to vendor databases, something like SharePoint or, uh, you know, what's the other gigantic SQL, sorry, Microsoft uh, system center, like making changes to things like that can actually invalidate your, your warranty or your support contract. So you're going to want to make sure that you don't make those changes. And if somebody pushes you to, this is a very good reason to give them pushback. So I do want to go over some tips for organizations without on-prem DBAs, and I'm going to make some assumptions, right? The assumption is that you're working probably for a smaller organization. And even if your organization isn't small, like your department is, whatever the SQL server is supporting. Also, I'm going to assume that you have a high recovery time objective or RTO. This is the amount of time that you're given um, if there's like a severe outage for you to come back to normal. Um, whenever I was in, in previous places that I've worked at, it was, I thought that it was pretty amazing that we had a 24 to 36 hour RTO. So they gave me plenty of time to make a lot of fixes. Um, and I could even rebuild an entire SQL server and then just restore everything from there. And then also I do assume a high recovery point objective or RPO. And this is um, how short you're given, how short of a span of time you're given to actually lose data. So whenever I set up my backups, um, it's every 15 minutes that, that I do it. So, um, but I have, even though like that's what I set, the organization was like, oh, we could lose one day of data. That's rare. Uh, but if you don't have a DBA, then that's also kind of expected. Another thing, when it comes to SQL Server high availability, I find that it often takes a lot of babysitting. Um, you have to be constantly involved in it. And what I suggest is just use whatever your organization is using for HA. So uh, in previous places, we would use VMware SRM, and that would back up uh, Exchange. It would back up the SharePoint servers. And if it's good enough for those servers, then it is good enough for your SQL servers if you do not have an on-prem DBA. 
the other thing, and I've kind of changed my position on this a little bit, is when it comes to transparent data encryption, it can introduce a lot of complexities. Um, it can make your backups unrestorable if you don't have your master key. Uh, so I do recommend against this and then in its place, actually recommend um, doing your encryption at the storage level. So things like uh, Dell Storage and NetApp have their encrypted storage. BitLocker will do as well, so you can rely on that. Also, you might be tempted when it comes to HA, you know, to use what the organization is using, but there is not a single SQL Server DBA that I'm aware of that recommends any third party database backups. I have to push back against this all the time. Um, Veritas, Commvault, Veeam, they can really mess up your database chains and you can end up losing data. The best um, the best database backups are built in and Microsoft backups are really considered the best of class. So don't do this either. Also, Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution, I do recommend this because all you have to do, it's, it's a script that you download, it's open source, it's built by this person who works for a bank. Ola Hallengren's scripts works for databases um, that are as, you know, as small as 10 megs or as big as 10 terabytes. And uh, these are the, the I, I recommend this and pretty much everybody else does as well. Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution will perform backups, full diffs and logs. Um, it will do uh, database integrity checks. It will rebuild your indexes. And so it'll keep your databases moving quickly. And it's pretty easy to install, especially with DBA tools. So now it is demo time. Do we have any questions so far? Mm -hmm. uh, will I be mentioning DBA checks? Um, you know, that's actually a really great point. I would need to talk to others, to other systems engineers. Are you a systems engineer who's using DBA checks? Okay, I, I won't be talking about it in here. So DBA checks is a really cool project that, that uses pester test to, um, to test out like, uh, a, your, a baseline, you know, to make sure that your backups are running, to make sure it actually goes through a lot of these things. It makes sure that your databases aren't corrupt, et cetera. And I actually haven't considered it for systems engineers, uh, but that is something that I'm going to consider. And, and after talking to some people, um, see if it does belong within this presentation. Thank you. I actually don't believe that I've ever used SP Blitz, um, but let's go ahead and take a look real quick. I believe that we'll have some time. DBA checks, DBA checks.io. Here, we're just telling you how to install it. These are the things that it, that it does. You definitely won't be able to see this. Um, trying to look for, we used to have, yeah, so it, it does come with a nice little dashboard so you can see how many of your things are failing. Um, and this one has like, we check for things like auto close where it closes the database and then it has to reopen. We, um, we advise against that. Um, also column identity usage. There's sometimes where people will use the wrong data type and then the, the, the column data like gets too big for the, uh, for the column. And then you have a bunch of problems because it can't update your database anymore. So this is what it does. I don't know if, if Brent's um, scripts do, do things like that. Like it checks for the last good DBCC check DB, um, it, the last backup times, uh, duplicate indexes, et cetera. And there's, there's actually about probably by now about a hundred checks that are available. Uh-huh. So now what I'm going to do, can everybody see this? 
And would it make it easier? Let's see, that's too big. I'm trying to make it as big for everyone. Is this is this good for everyone? And or would it be better? Let me change this to the color theme. Uh, let's see, just lights default. Oh, wow, that's nice. Is this better for everyone? No? <laughs> All right, let me go back to 1984 and bold it. That's my favorite. So I do start out every, um, I start out every script with a break at the top in case I accidentally hit this button instead of that one. But anytime that I join an organization, I follow a number of steps. And actually, when we Whenever I, I created the table of contents for DBA tools in a month of lunches, I literally followed the path of what it's like whenever I first start at the organization. So the first thing that I'm going to cover is finding SQL Server instances, because I've never actually been at an organization where they accurately report um, the, the instances that are on the network. There's always a bunch that somebody accidentally installs and then it's not getting backed up or that log is growing. So it's really important to find your instances. I'm gonna show you how to connect to it. Also, like I talked about before, checking your backups, checking your disk space, performing your backups, checking for corruption, installing Ola Hallengren's maintenance scripts, also something that is super awesome, we have one command that will export all of your settings for DR. So for me, um, I do still manage some SQL servers and anytime before I make changes, I'll just run this export command and I feel like really safe and reassured that if I, let's say accidentally or intentionally drop a login and then realize that I have to put it back, I have all of those scripts available. I'll show you how to look for failed jobs. Um, we'll check a few settings that are important that often get overlooked. Um, we'll also see what SQL components are installed because a lot of times, I know whenever I first started installing SQL Server, I'm like, oh my God, all of this is available. Let me just install everything. And this was torture whenever we got audited that I actually had to justify each of those features that were installed and I had to uninstall stuff and then not know, I had to do my best guess to see if it was actually um, in use. So my, uh, one of my recommendations is only install what you need. Also, we are going to discover the SQL Server service accounts that actually runs the service. Um, updating SQL Server, so many systems engineers love this. Instead of actually manually patching your SQL servers, you can just use PowerShell and it even works remotely. It's really cool. It does pattern matching that you could just point at a directory, it's awesome. We're also gonna do a migration. And then the last thing is just something called lanyap. This means extra in Cajun French. So we'll just do a little extra at the end. So first let's look around SQL Server Management Studio. This is free, you can download it. Um, let me see, I think that this is the biggest it gets. I apologize. Yeah, it's already in presenter mode. Um, yeah, I really wish that I could hit Control Plus, but it's built on top of Visual Studio. And so you can't really Control Plus, yeah. All right, so um, how many of you have actually opened up and looked around SQL Server Management Studio. And awesome. Okay, cool. Fantastic. That means that you're all pretty familiar with this. I'll go over it just real quick anyway. What was really nice about, I love it. I use it all the time, even though I created DBA tools, even though I love PowerShell, there are some times where I'm just like, oh, it's so much easier to go in. Um, and whenever I was making all of the migration commands, I literally like went through here and you know, like click here, oh, I can do the logins. I can do, I still haven't done the server roles. Um, I don't know what, I think that for some reason it was very challenging, um, but like credentials, audits, et cetera. That's really cool that everybody here has, has actually been in here. So you're familiar with the agent jobs and things like this. And right now this is, I'm connecting to a Docker instance. I did create um, some Docker containers and I made them available to the, to the community. Um, it's really easy to install. And I even have a tutorial that I'll show you later on. 
So I'm just so impressed by what Microsoft has done. Like I said before, like the feature parity is, is just ridiculous. The first time that I saw a SQL Server agent running on um, SQL on Linux, I was just blown away. So here we have, <clears throat> yeah, there's three instances. This one is SQL CS and I installed it uh, specifically for testing our DBA tools commands because it's case sensitive. And I really hope that you never inherit a case sensitive SQL server um, because it just, a lot of people don't expect it. Even us, as we're building the tool set, we'll get issues and they're like, oh, this doesn't work on my case sensitive server. So I did have to install one uh, on my lab. And this is my lab, if you're interested. I recently got tired of VMware hating on community community hardware. I like to run shuttles because um, because they're light and they are uh, they don't make a lot of noise and they're actually super energy efficient, which is especially helpful in Europe where energy costs are just like super high. But I have a little infra here. I'll make this bigger. It's really cool. Um, the The learning curve for Proxmox is a bit high, but once I was finally able to get everything stable, it has been super cool. It has backups built in, which is really nice. I never got that from my, my VMware setup. But yeah, so I have these two are clustered. And then I do have it going all the way back to SQL 2000 because we do have end users that are still using it and still do report issues if we forgot to accommodate for SQL 2000. We try our best. We don't, there's not 100% coverage, but we do try it if it's like low hanging fruit. All right, so we looked around SQL Server Management Studio. By the way, this object explorer details is really nice. Some people forget about it. So if you go here to view and then object explorer details, if you need to like drop a bunch of databases, it makes it easy. And if you don't have DBA tools, DBA tools makes it super easy, but this makes it second to easiest, this object explorer details view. All right, so the first thing, we're gonna find some unknown instances and uh, we're gonna use find DBA instance. This was created by Frederick Weinman. Uh, Fred is awesome. He presents a lot at, uh, at the summit, um, super brilliant guy. And I actually asked him to build this. It is extremely, it's a very intense command. Uh, what happened is whenever I would start at a company, I would go in and I would run five separate tools. I would run one from Dell, uh, Quest, Microsoft. There's all these different ones that do like, they have some coverage, but in order to get 100% coverage in the past, you had to run all of these different um, applications. And so what we did was we took all of those methods and put it into one command called find DBA instance. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna have it probe Mac mini, SQL CS and SQL 2000. I'm gonna use select star so that, because by default, um, it shows you a limited amount of information, but I wanna show you some more for this presentation. And we're gonna stick it, we're gonna pipe it to outgrid view. We're gonna use some little, I love that, the progress bars. You know what I love about progress bars? <laughs> I always like call over the customer and it just like, it looks so flashy, especially when you're using Pester and it's just like, it's awesome. It's impressive. So now it's going through SQL WMI. Um, it's looking up SPNs. So it's reaching out to Active Directory. It probes TCP port 1433. It does some like UDP broadcasts. It's extremely intense. It will take a long time to run um, which is why I just ran it. You can run it against an IP range, which is usually what I do, but it takes about 10 seconds per server. So just, keep, or, or per IP. So just keep that in mind or per host even. But it's really cool. You could pipe in things from get AD object. Um, so I thought that was awesome. So here you could see the results. It did find a SQL server on each of these. I, this, the Mac mini is actually running two um, SQL Server instances, but it didn't probe all of TCP. It just hit port 1433. And then we could see here, this SQL CS, it was able to log in and then grab, it could actually see the services that are running here. So it really got deep in there. 
And you can see like, sometimes we have like high confidence, medium confidence. You could put in um, a SQL credential for it to actually try to log in and connect to it. Um, it's a very powerful command, but again, it could take a long time. So the next thing that we're going to do is connect. And you probably won't use the connect um, command unless you're probably just like trying to see if you can get access to a SQL server. So this is connect DBA instance. All of our SQL, all of our commands are standardized. So you can pass them SQL instance, SQL credential. Um, and then the ones that connect using remoting, that is computer name. So now we're going to connect to SQL 2000 and SQL CS. And let me close this here. Clear, and then I'm gonna try again. So this is cool. Um, you can see that we connected, it gives you a little bit of information, tells you who you're logged in as, and then you can do um, select star and get way more information. Like SMO is super powerful. As a matter of fact, I'd like to show you just how powerful it is. Hopefully this won't take too long, but I was really impressed by, um, if you do actually, let's do a get member. Type that to get member. This is how I, this is really what, um, control C. This is really what inspired me to start using PowerShell is when I saw how many things were available. Like you can get the root directory. Usually you have to log in, I think, and get it from the registry. And it's just like, it's such a pain. But what's really cool, it has all of these properties and then also just a ton of methods that, that you can work with. And initially um, it, was, it, was, it was overwhelming, but then I also saw the power to it and then just kind of took it step, took it, yeah, step by step. Um, and now this is just one of, I love APIs. And this is one of my favorite APIs in the world. It's, it's just super cool. All right, the next thing that we're going to do is use a SQL credential. Um, out the gate, if, you are, if your SQL servers are getting audited, you wanna try as best you can. I'm gonna go here to a Windows machine. You wanna try as best you can um, to ensure that it's just Windows authentication mode. But there are things like VMware that use like this Java ODBC background uh, uh, connector in the background. And so it does need SQL server um, authentication. And so if you, if you do enable this and you get audited, um, this just does introduce a whole bunch more steps. So if you can default to this. Also, by the way, if you change this setting, you do have to restart your SQL server um, for it to take effect. And also if you change it from Windows, uh, if, if it's only on Windows authentication, you can make a SQL server login. So you might make the assumption that it's actually enabled. If you make it and you can't connect and it's driving you crazy, that is the reason that you need to go and, uh, and actually change that setting. That has caught me so many times over the years. So that one has SQL auth enabled. So let's go ahead and get our credential. And now we're gonna log in as SQL admin. I'm gonna put in dbatools.io as the password. And I'm gonna try to connect. Oh no, login failed. It, this happens all the time. I'm given a SQL server and they're like, here's the IP, here's where it backs up its, its databases. And I can log into the Windows server, but I can't actually log into the SQL server. And we created a command that will actually add the credential and it does everything for you. It's, it's really cool. Um, I just followed Microsoft's process where you log in and then you stop the service, you start it in single user. It's like 57 steps, but now it's just one command. So let's go ahead and add that login. So because it does have to restart the SQL server, we do prompt. So it says, uh, stop SQL CS to restart in single user mode, yes. So we got some more some more little, some little toolbars. Um, now we're gonna start it again. 
And now we're gonna test it to ensure that it's back up. Nice. And then we're gonna actually add the login. And there's so many steps. We're gonna enable mixed mode authentication. That's also what that was called. So there's Windows Auth and then there's mixed mode. And because we passed a SQL login, it does need to be in mixed mode. And then now we're going to actually enable it because sometimes uh, if you try to log in, maybe you were actually, uh, it was a valid username, a valid password, but the account was disabled. So this just goes through and does it as cleanly as possible. It just takes care of like all of the potential reasons. Um, it also, it's gonna add SQL admin to the sysadmin role. And now it's restarting. And we're gonna log in to get that account information. And there it is. So it has added the user and or reset the password. Before, let's see, I created on 116. So it was just, um, so this one did do a password reset. Ah, so sorry. Let me go back up. And now what we're gonna do, because we have added that, we're going to prove that it worked. If you remember before I got that, that login failed, and now we're going to log in and now I'm connected to SQL admin. This is one of my favorite commands because it's so useful. Um, and it also, there's so many um, tests within it to ensure that the SQL server does come back up. I also feel comfortable running it. Whereas doing it manually, I'd be like kind of terrified. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is check our backups with get DBA last backup. And we're gonna send this to an out grid view. Sometimes this happens um, in the background. This is actually what it looks like when you have um, uh, an external backup source that's going in and messing up your chains. Sometimes it's a problem, sometimes it's not. So here we could see that we've had a last full backup, but no log backups. So model and worldwide importers might actually, and, and actually Adventure Works too, these will just keep growing and growing. So this is a this is a problem SQL instance so far. And it'll tell you the status so that we just kind of interpret it for you and then make it straightforward. So yeah, this would be problematic that this database was created 946 days ago and it just has never been backed up. So if your backups are missing, you could check your disk space. And what I like about this command is even if you aren't um, using SQL Server. I really like this command just in general. I wish that it would be available in, in, uh, in PowerShell in general. So we could see that we have 81% free. That is plenty of space for us to perform our uh, backups. And then also, let's see. I'm not too sure why I did too, maybe just to show. Oh, these have more, that's why. This is a clustered instance, woo. So you can see that it's a little bit different there and that right now um, the cluster is on node two. So we could see all of that. So now that we know that we have enough space, let's hurry up and back up the database. I encourage you to either set compression as default at, in the SQL Server, you can use either DBA tools or you can use SQL Server Management Studio. Um, and compression is awesome because it is faster. There's a very small hit on your CPU, but for the most part, you don't even notice it. Um, this is just better in all of the different ways. So I'm not just gonna go through and back up everything. You could just sit back and relax and be like, oh, thank God, now I have backups. Although you are backing up to the same disk. So before we ran get DBA last backup um, and there were a whole bunch of things that are missing. You know what else I wanna do? I want to, some of them had log backups that needed to be created. So let's do type log and backup those as well so that this is gonna come out as nice as possible. So I saw some warnings there, let's see. Oh, it's in simple recovery mode. So um, simple doesn't need to be backed up that way. So now we're going to get our last backup. And we could see, you know what? I'm gonna pipe this to out grid view. <laughs> Damn it. All right.
So we can see that we have our last full backup and our last log backups for the ones that are in, um, in the full recovery model. Ignore this because I forgot why it's not good. Let's clear that. So I have to answer for it. All right, so the next thing is we are going to check our last good check DB. This is to ensure that there's no corruption. And then I'm gonna pipe that to outgrid view. So it says check DB should be performed, new database not checked yet. Um, temp DB and AdventureWorks. Yeah, I just created AdventureWorks right before this. So we really do need to um, do some check DBs. And I will show you, there's, there's, D, there's a DBA tools command for it, but I tend to use Ola Hallengren script. So let's go ahead and take a look at his webpage real quick. Ola. So it's really nice. You actually just download this maintenance solution. Um, you could you could download it piecemeal, but I never do. Um, so I get the whole thing and then I'll open it up there. And then you just change, you can, if, if you're doing this manually without DBA tools, sometimes it happens. So you really just have to change a couple things. Create jobs. So this is gonna put it on a schedule um, or it'll create the job and then you can actually make the schedule. For your backup directory, I recommend um, SQL Server can back up to a NAS. And so I would just do like SAN SQL backups, uh, do it that way. And then that way, whenever your NAS is replicated to a secondary site, then all your backups are as well. Cleanup time, ooh, so important because if you don't set a cleanup time, then your backups just stay there for years. And I have done this before and uh, it was unfortunate. So let's just say 720 hours and output file. So each time that it runs the, the, uh, the jobs, it will output a file to a directory. And so I'll just keep that default log to table. I never care, but if y'all do, you could say yes. And then that's all you have to do. And then you execute the, uh, the scripts and you're set. You could do more. You don't have to, as a systems engineer, just do that. All right, so this instead, we are going to use DBA tools. Um, it says, talk about the importance of logs and scheduling and permissions. So the permissions, uh, that slash slash SAN SQL backups, the agent job has to have permission, or sorry, the agent engine or agent service account. Let me see what I'm running as. So services.msc. Let's see if I can make this bigger. No, sorry, everyone. So we're gonna hit S, go down. So this is running as AD SQL Server. So um, oh, it's actually the agent. Um, so I'm going to make sure that AD slash SQL Server has access to that share. Install jobs, true. Replace existing true. So if you're updating, um, you would just overwrite. You would just overwrite, this isn't the jobs that's being replaced, it is the store procedures. So let's run this. So it went and it downloaded it and then it cached a copy. If you are in an offline environment, you can also um, download that SQL file and then just point to that file. So now let's go log into the SQL CS and take a look at a couple things. First, I installed it in the master database. That's where it goes by default. It doesn't hurt. Um, some DBAs do like to install it in MSDB. MSDB is where it keeps like all of the job information. That is a valid place. So is master. Um, so let's go ahead and look at programmability and stored procedures. So these are the stored procedures that, uh, that this installs. I never look at these. I just trust that Ola Hallengren's stuff, he knows what he's doing way better than I do. So I just execute them. Now we're gonna run some backups. Okay, oh, I love new DBA database, especially if you're a developer. I've literally created 1000 databases 
with this command because I just do like one to 1000 and then or whatever for each object. I think I did this wrong. Let's see. I don't know. Yeah, there we go. And then for each object and it'll create those by default. I tried to make sure that that our commands were as convenient as possible. So the only thing that you have to pass is see is the the instance name and um, and it'll just generate a, a database name for you. So there we go. We have a new database called random. And then next, now that we have that new database that needs to be backed up, um, we're going to use get DB, DBA agent job. We're gonna pipe that to grid view. We're going to select one of the jobs and then start it. And instead of it just like coming back immediately and being asynchronous, we're gonna wait for it. So if you're not familiar with out grid view pass through, I love it. It's one of my favorite things, totally recommend it. It allows you, it enables this okay button down at the bottom. So let's, let's select. I want to run some full, I'm gonna do full for user database. And now it's going to wait as it backs up my user databases. Cool, sweet, it succeeded. So that was very nice. So these are the, um, the agent jobs. Sorry, I should have highlighted this earlier. These are the agent jobs that are created. Now they are created, but they're not scheduled. So you're gonna want to create a staggered schedule. And I do wanna to walk, this, uh, walk you through this visually um, because I had actually made a few mistakes whenever I was first doing this, I would just create a new schedule over and over instead of like reusing it. So let's just say that you want to back up your system and user databases all at once, uh, like at the same time. So what we're going to do is go to properties, schedules, new, and say uh, you wanna do it weekly, weekly backup. Then we pick weekly, it occurs on Sunday. Everything's happening at, at midnight. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just do it like 1.15. Say okay. And if you want to see what's happening, you can hit script up here. I'm just gonna hit okay. Now I also want to schedule my user databases being backed up at the same time. So instead of hitting new, go to pick and then pick that weekly backup and do it that way. This will like keep all your schedules nice and clean. You reuse them as appropriate. So full is, it'll back up the entire database. Diff is a differential. So let's say that you back up your database uh, and you do a full database on, uh, on Sunday and then you run your diff on Monday. That'll be, let's say like 10 extra megs, right? On Tuesday, if you run the diff again, it's going to be Monday and Tuesday. So that's gonna be like 20 megs and it'll just keep growing over time until you run that full again. And then uh, the diff will come back down. So what I tend to do is I'll do, it really depends on the machine. If they're tiny databases, I'll back them up with a full every day, I'll skip diffs. If they're larger, like a SharePoint farm, then I'll do full once a week, um, diff each night and then logs every 15 minutes. The integrity checks. Integrity checks are pretty intense. Um, and as well as the index optimization, this can really put some, some strain on your storage. Um, so what you wanna do is a lot of times, like I'll do my integrity checks at Saturday at 3 a.m and then my index optimization at like Sunday at 3 a.m. But sometimes maybe that index optimization might take so long that it should actually be scheduled on Friday um, at 10. But if you have a database that big, then, then you probably have a DBA and don't even have to worry about this. But these are, this is like, this is just very, uh, very essential of a process to make sure you have your backups, your integrity checks, and your index optimization. 
All right, so we backed it up and now I'm gonna invoke item and we'll actually take a look at the backups. So it opens it up here. So we could see I've backed up some other instances and here's SQL CS. This is by default what uh, the backup path looks like. You know, you have the database name and then once you go in, it'll be full and diff. And I didn't run a log yet. So let me go ahead and manually execute the log so that we could see this happening. I could also use DBA tools to like find and execute it. You could find it by name and then pipe it to start. And then now whenever we go back, there should be, there it is. So we have the log. And what's really awesome about DBA tools is you can literally point it at this uh, AdventureWorks directory, it'll go inside each of these and figure out the most recent fold, the most recent diff and the most recent log, and it will restore all of that for you. And that is so impressive. That was done by Stuart Moore. I absolutely love the work that he's done with backup and restore. It's like genius and fun and easy to work with. And as a matter of fact, what you could do is you could do a get child item, exclude master, uh, probably MSDB, yeah, you could keep that. Um, and then you can restore an entire instance just by doing get child item, you know, where name, not master, and then uh, pipe that to restore DBA database. And, and the whole thing is back. Like after I made the initial command that did this, I just, it felt so relaxing because before you really had to put a lot of work into, um, you know, like putting those chains back together yourself. Um, and this just makes it so easy. And it really showed the SQL Server community, the power of PowerShell. It was one of the first, like just stand out features that we were all like, oh, this is so nice that we don't have to like try to use like force T SQL to do this for us. It's just so natural with, uh, with PowerShell. All right, so if you're curious, let's see. Yeah, we could specify the job this way. One moment, sorry. Okay. So we could specify the job this way and I'll just execute it from here. This is without a wait. Oh, and then we'll do get DBA running job. I don't know if I have a bit, if I, ah, oh, I don't have a fast enough. I don't have a big enough database to get that running job. I love this. You can actually pipe in, like if you have a collection, even in a text file, you would do get content, pipe it to get DBA running job, and you can find all of the jobs that are currently running throughout your entire estate. I used to use this all of the time. So we could see, dang it, okay, it'll be just too fast, but... Um, yeah, that is something that's really, really cool. It just, it'll actually look exactly like this. Uh, it'll, it'll return back a full SMO object of the, of the agent job. All right, go schedule, then disable the, uh, go, oh yeah. So I went schedule the jobs and now I need to disable VSS. So VSS, it is what Veritas and Veeam and all of those, uh, what service? MSC. No. Um, SQL VSS is what Veritas and Veeam and all of those use to actually like go in from the back and like do a quick little backup. Um, so what I, that's this is one of the first things that I do. What's probably happening and the reason that my chain is messed up and you saw that that yellow warning is because Proxmox um, does backup my my SQL server. So what I wanna do is stop and disable this. And I could do it right here, but what we're going to do is just use PowerShell, uh, get service, display name, set service stopped, and then disable it. Oh, that's SQL CS, oops. Um, so that is something that I do encourage. Test DBA last backup is awesome because so many times you hear people saying, oh, you need to test your backups. It should really be world restore day, not world backup day. Um, and what's really incredible about test DBA last backup is that it will go through and it will grab your last full diff and log. It'll put that together. It'll actually restore it to your SQL server and it will, it, it'll change the name and it'll change the underlying file name. So there's never gonna be a clash. 
And uh, then it actually performs an integrity check. And then once everything passes, then it drops it. So it's really awesome. Let's see this in action. This is really cool. I was able to show what you can do is you can actually pipe this to write DBA, DB table data. Um, you can write it to a SQL table and then use that to prove to your auditors that you are testing your backups. Ah, I just love it. So we could see it skipped uh, the master restore because you actually can't, you can't, it's interesting. Even if you rename it, you can't restore it. But so far, all of my backups are really good. And you can see um, you know, how long it takes, the backup dates, the actual files that are used. So you can see that these are using it from the disk and these are using it from the SAN. So this is just such a really, really cool command um, that really simplifies a very, very tedious process. Next up, this is one of the ones I was talking about for DR. This command, export DBA instance, uh, wraps like 20 uh, underlying commands and it just does everything for you. So let's go here, temp DR. Let me make sure that temp DR, dir temp DR. Okay, nothing there. Recurse? Nope, okay, sweet, it's empty. All right, so we're going to export there. So that's the configuration, SP configure. You might have heard about it. The registered servers. It doesn't actually back up your databases and put it in here. What it does is it backs up the T-SQL that you can just execute to restore all of your databases. We got some replication in the mix. It actually exports the user objects and the system databases. Ooh. Oh, that was nice. Yeah, somebody added that the other day that they exported the OLEDB providers. Uh, it exports all of your jobs. So let's go ahead and look at this. Oh God. Oh, okay. Whew. <laughs> I, I got, oh my God. I totally thought that I was just about to like restore the entire instance. I used to do that for, um, for one of my DR sessions. I was like, I don't recommend doing this, but look what could happen. So I would like build this whole instance. I would destroy everything on it. And then I would put it all back. But this allows you to see um, for the databases, the type of T-SQL that comes out of it, that it, it'll do the LDS, like the, um, it'll do, you know, the logs and the master and, and the, the MDF and all of that and the directory invoke item C temp DR. Oh, I think, I guess it was over there anyway. So this is what it looks like. It automatically does this rename unless you specify the path. And then here's all the T-SQL that you could just use to restore everything. It didn't take that long. I just always run this before making any, um, any changes to, uh, or any significant changes to a SQL server database server. All right, next up, ooh. All right, if you wanna get the details on SQL Server agent, it could be kind of confusing because you can use, there's this, you'll be really tempted to, um, to use the PowerShell engine in the back. Uh, I don't recommend it, I don't like it. This goes into a whole bunch of details and it, and it compares like the built-in SQL Server engine, um, sorry, the built-in PowerShell engine in the agent. Uh, versus what I suggest and what a lot of people suggest, which is to use the command engine and then call PowerShell from there. So if you're interested and you want to know more, this is like a huge deep dive that explains everything, um, including credentials. So we had looked earlier and I had talked about how make sure your SQL Server agent has access to that backup directory. But what you can do is create something called a SQL Server credential, which is different from a SQL Server login. If you've worked with Azure, then this um, probably makes a little bit more sense. I know whenever I first logged into SQL Server, I was like, man, like I thought that I created a credential, but then like it didn't make any sense to me. And now it does. So you create a credential and then it can run as another user without causing any type of like uh, Kerberos double hops. But you can run your backups um, as that user that you create, and then it, you don't even have to care about the, the SQL Server agent service permissions. All 
All right, so now we're gonna look for some failed jobs. So we're gonna find DBA agent jobs, get the failed ones, and then get the job history of that failed one. Cool. So here um, I, I have a job called Big Broke <laughs> and the step name is bad syntax and I just put some bad syntax in there. But it's really cool that you can you can actually see why and when um, the SQL Server job started breaking. To see why the job failed, you can also open up SSMS and then expand the job step. Let me show y'all here. So we could go to Big Broke, view history. Expand it. You always think like, oh, this is going to show info. It never does the first one. I don't know why. But the second one is going to give you um, that information where it says, uh, you know, there's incorrect syntax. And then you can go ahead and look at your steps. So if you go to properties and then steps, double click here. And then you can see it just says select. So this is, uh, this is bad syntax and that's why it failed. All right, this is cool. So we test the max memory and then we, we have a formula that will automatically determine how much memory you should set it to. So let's say you have a SQL Server, like out the gate, SQL Server is going to take everything that it possibly can. It's up to two terabytes, I believe. Um, and this is something that anytime that I've inherited a SQL Server, it's always had its RAM maxed out that suffocates the OS and it reduces performance. Um, and then there was this guy named Jonathan Kenyanis and he wrote a blog post. And then we took that blog post and his little formula and we translated it into PowerShell. And now you could just see. So this is the SQL instance workstation. That's for the max memory. So this is just a SQL setting. Oh no, why is it failing? I'll do SQL CS. Oh, I know why. That is because uh, whenever I created this, um, I have a SQL Server instance that was running that SQL Server on Windows, which allows me to log in via Windows. What I could do is go back here, SQL credential. And then before I had set up that cred and I should be able to log in this way. Let's see, maybe not. What's it doing? There we go, okay, all righty. Oh, that's what it is, okay. So what happens is it actually logs in and then it, it, it tries to see how many instances you're running because if you have multiple instances on one server, then it's gonna reduce the amount that's recommended for the server, for the instance that you are, um, that you're addressing. The reason that I couldn't get the accurate SQL Server instance count is because I'm not running as admin and this particular command, and this is localhost, this particular command uses SQL WMI. Um, SQL WMI is this CLI. So if you do CLI, C-O-N-F-G, Nope, that's not the one, but you know, you get this prompt. Um, aliases are cool, by the way. I don't think that we'll cover it here, but if you go to computer management, this is a general FYI. You go here to SQL Server Configuration Manager. Um, this does require administrative privileges. Everything here that you see is all SQL WMI. So you're not actually logging in using your your SQL credentials, these are your window credential, Windows credentials. This isn't available on Linux. So that's just some, and oh, I'll be covering this later. I'm actually gonna keep this up because we're gonna cover it uh, very shortly. Right now we have test DBA. Oh, the power plan is also something that's important. Um, maybe I didn't set it back, we will see. So we're gonna test our power plan. Um, by default, Windows often installs with the balanced power plan and that totally impacts SQL Server's performance. Sweet, all right, so I just did a what if, but I could take it off and then we could change it. Um, this command was interesting because uh, in, I had never really programmed for a, like a localized community. And I literally look for the word high performance and then somebody ran it against their German machine and they're like, high performance doesn't exist. 
So we had to go to the GUID and I was like, oh, that's cool. I'd read a lot about localization, um, but I never had to do it before. So that is really something that's, that's cool about um, programming a tool set that is used internationally. So now the previous power plan was balanced. Now it's high performance and this is you know, gonna be awesome. Another thing kind of like get DBA disk space um, can be used even if you're not using SQL Server. The get DBA operating system is good to see for any system and also a computer system. So let's look at out grid view. I'll do it here too. So this will get you some detailed information and imagine just like piping in act literally from Active Directory in here and it'll go in and grab all of the stuff for you and get you this information. And then the same for the computer system. So that was the OS and now this is the computer system. So this shows more details about like things like the domain. That's cool. I'd never looked at this before. Uh, the QEMU, QEMU, I don't know. But anyway, that's what Proxmox uses um, under, under its cover. So you could see like my type of processor, et cetera. That's some, some more WMI. But yeah, we talked about earlier, only install what you need. This one's kind of funny because it goes in and it actually executes an EXE. It has an export. because This is the only way that Microsoft made it possible. Um, you export it to like an HTML file and then we parse the HTML file. And I was like, I can't believe that this is the way that it has to be done, but that's the way that it has to be done. So it does take a moment to go through there. All right, so let's see what's installed on SQL CS. See, each of these things, the database engine service is whenever you hit like port 1433, just log in, right? And then full text and semantic extractions for search. If you're not using full text search um, and you get audited, you'll get dinged on that because it just increases your attack area, your surface area. Data quality services, I have no idea why I even installed it on there. Maybe I was just interested that day. All right, next up is get DBA service. It's super cool. Uh, this will log in and get all of your services that are SQL related, but not SQL VSS. Maybe we should add it. So now this is going to go, you can see that computer name and that's different from the SQL instance. And a lot of times if it's computer name, we will be using WMI. So we can see that I like this, this is useful. Um, and, and it's also pretty fast. This is what I wanna tell you all about. Okay, so that was like just the, um, that was an overview, but let's get some details about it. If you need this in the future, let you know the binary path, the description, et cetera. So this is just kind of like if you click on, um, if you double click on there. All right, so another thing as a systems engineer, somebody might tell you, oh, this is running as local system. You need to change the service account for SQL Server and then you'll be tempted and you'll be like, all right, I'll just go here. I'll double click here. I'll go to login and I'm gonna change it here. Do not do this. And the reason is because when you, when you change it here, there's a whole bunch of stuff that is left out that is actually done uh, much better using SQL Server's tool. So if you remember, we were here, we went to computer management and then you expand. You could probably also potentially go to start and then uh, do the configuration manager from there. But a lot of times my computer doesn't find it, so it, but it always finds this. So, all right, you're gonna wanna change it here. And what this will do is it will change the permissions in addition to the username and password and actually restarting your service. It will also change permissions on the file system um, that are required. And I believe it'll actually also change some things in the registry that needs to align as well. But there's one thing that it doesn't change, which is really important. 
Um, if you are if you are encrypting your network connections, and let's go see what that looks like. So you double click on protocols. I think you go to properties. Yeah. So if you set force encryption to yes, and then you have a certificate like this, um, like SQL Server, then um, you hit apply and you go here to flags. This is how you would set encryption. I've, I've been really impressed by the force encryption. Um, everything pretty much has supported it except for maybe some random Java from like the 90s, um, but it's pretty seamless. So this is how you would do it. Now, when you change your, uh, your service account, it doesn't change the permissions on the certificate. And this will literally stop your SQL server from even starting up. But it okay if you if you use dba tools we do all of that for you right so let me go ahead and so we do a get dba service uh, we specify the instance so the default instance is called ms sql server and then here we're going to be changing the service account for agent we're going to use update dba service account and give it a username and then we will set it to verbose so we could see what's happening Look at all of that that we do and well that we're just resolving. But we could see that we found it. This is all in the SQL server. Um, yeah, we have this DBA CM object, which is like a computer object that we work with. That was actually done by Fred as well. Sorry, that wasn't as interesting as I thought that it would be, but it does a lot, I think was the point. Um, and then it has been successfully set. So when uh, it's essentially like using this tool right here, plus an extra step that is super important because it also changed the permissions on the certificate so that the account um, can actually read that certificate and continue to encrypt your data. Uh, sorry, your network connection. All right, the next thing we're going to do ooh, is we have a test DBA build. A lot of people, man, so many people love this one. It actually checks to see if you are on like the latest whatever. Um, this is based off of a JSON file. And it'll go through, ooh, I'm RTM. So I would fail that, right? So am I compliant? So my current, let's see. So the SQL instance is SQL CS. It's supported until 2025, just around the corner. The build is 15.0.2000, but our target, the most recent one, the dash latest is 15.0.4198. So we know that we have to upgrade our SQL server to be compliant. And in order to do that, what you could do, I could execute this. I love update DBA instance. You can see here, you can specify a computer name and it'll go and do it. I actually upgraded every single one of my SQL servers using this command. I also installed all of my SQL servers. I didn't use DSC. I ended up using um, install DBA instance and I loved it. It was awesome. So here we go. Let's see. Oh man, I want, oh, I'm not executing this. Okay, cool. Um, Instead of actually executing it, I'm going to ex uh, to run an MP4 file. So here we have the, we executed that command. It'll go and it'll like parse out all of the files. It'll say, hey, I found this one. Is this the one that you wanna use? And then you say yes. And then it just patches it for you while you chill. And boom, now it's updated. Um, and it's, it's just like, it's so convenient and so many people, um, so many systems engineers also really, really love this command. Next, uh, perform the database and accompanying login migration. Sometimes you don't want to migrate that entire instance, right? Um, we do have piecemeal copy commands. In this case, what I will do is I will copy Let's see, I think I set up AdventureWorks, yeah. So this is copy DBA database, we'll set the source, which is SQL CS, the destination is SQL cluster database, backup restore. The other um, parameter that we could use here, 
if I could go back in time, I would say type backup restore, but we have dash backup restore, a dash detach and attach. Um, so a detach will actually detach the database, copy it over, and then reattach it on the, on the remote one. This does cause more downtime because you're copying these giant files instead of these nicely compressed backup files. So you do have to make sure with this shared path that both of the SQL Server service accounts on each server has access to this path. And you run this copy DBA database. This will do everything for you, right? So it copies over the database, but then also whenever you perform a backup and restore, let me do a force. When you perform a backup and restore, um, you lose a couple, like three properties in the database. And what copy DBA database does is it puts those properties back. So there we go, it's backing it up. Or you could say dash use last backup and you won't even have to, um, It'll, it'll get your last full diffs and logs. And the same for the logins. So logins, this was heaven sent. Like the first time that I did it, I was like, man, this is just, it's so much better. Microsoft used to have this very incomplete uh, solution called SP Help Rev Login. Uh, and, with, and with PowerShell, we do use pieces of that, that stored procedure to do the, so you can never actually see the password. Um, it's hashed, but it'll copy over everything. So if we go to security and we look at the logins, like there's so much more to a login than just the name, right? If you, by the way, if somebody's like, oh my God, can you please add a SQL login? Uh, there was a SQL login called Potato on the first server. Can you please create one on the second? If you create a login called Potato on the on the second server and you haven't migrated it using PowerShell, that underlying SID is going to change and you're going to have an orphaned login. So that isn't a good way to actually do it. But what's really cool is that there's like there's so many things that are associated um, with an account outside, let me use one of these, outside of just the username and password, you have this enforced password policy, mapping to credential, setting your default database and language, all of these server roles, all of this like user mapping, securables. And so we take care of all of that with copy DBA login. This is just a huge relief for SQL Server DBAs. Um, now we're going to do some lanyap. It looks like we got about eight minutes left. I'm just going to quickly go over this. Um, if you want to explore SQL Server, but you don't want to mess up your machine and install, um, you know, like a whole instance, you can use Docker containers. I created this. It used to be a blog post, and then I moved it to GitHub discussions because I totally boned the site. Um, but it ended up being a good place. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you could copy and paste that makes it incredibly easy. Look at this. Like it, it so we have a, a Docker container that comes with all of the Ola Hallengren stuff. It comes with Northwinds and pubs, which are like these old sample databases. And then I created like an old school backup device because nobody uses those. Um, and I added a couple things that make it a fun and useful um, SQL Server instance to migrate to the second instance. And you can kind of learn that way. So I show you here that you just copy and paste this. It's really awesome. Whenever you create a Docker um, network, then your two SQL servers can actually talk to each other. And that's how that is possible. So you can log in. By the way, when you log in and you don't have the SQL Server browser service running, so this is like a named instance without a name, but if you know the port, then you can connect to it. With SQL Server Management Studio, um, if it was named, you would put slash and then the name like SQL Express, right? With a port, you put a comma and then one, four, three, 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 or whatever the port is. But as you know, with PowerShell, a comma means something different, right? It would interpret that as server one, server two. So what we do is we do support it if you put it in quotes and you say like localhost comma one, four, three, three, three. But if you don't want to mess with quotes, you can actually just do localhost colon one, four, three, three, three. We'll say, oh, they're using a colon. Let's replace this with the comma. And so we kind of make it convenient for you there. This sets up availability groups if you want to play. I never want to play with availability groups. Some people do. You can 
You could do exports, so you could test all of that out. This is a lot of the stuff that we saw before, and it just keeps your machine clean. You can mess up one and then just like restart it, and it's totally, you know, it's going to come up with a clean slate. So I do have that if you are, uh, if you're interested. Also, if you have like more than one SQL server um, and you want to use registered servers, they are super nice. So you go here and you have these uh, these local server groups. Ah, oh, that was awesome. I forgot you could do that. So if you go to, if you go to properties, then you see the server name and you can name it whatever you want. You set your authentication. Look, we support all of that. So cool. Um, you know, you could do like the SQL admin, dbatools.io, and you could do like that. And then what you, once you have this, you can even actually use DBA tools to import from a CSV file. Um, and yeah, so imagine if there's just like a ton of these, right? It's a really great like centralized inventory kind of place. And then you could use DBA tools. So let's go ahead and look at our registered servers. So I have our first container instance. And what's really awesome is whenever you do this under the hood, it actually keeps your logins. Um, and so you don't have to, you could act, you don't have to set a SQL credential. So let's do get DBA data. Oh, wait, wait, no, no, get reg server. And then pipe that to get DBA database. I wonder if I did that. So it, it Notice that I didn't put in that SQL credential, but these are Docker containers and they require a SQL credential, but that is stored in the registered server. And, uh, and that's just like, it's so useful. You can also just like, you could pipe it in if you want a specific one, you could just call it out by name and boom, it connected to that instance. Oh, if you are, I love tools, options, like whenever you go to like system preferences and there's like things to change, uh, DBA tools actually has that. We have get DBA tools config and set. This is more of Fred's magic. Um, we have a whole, look at all of these settings. This is just like so cool. Um, this really gives you more control. You can even control like what your dates look like and how they're formatted. So if you're from another country, it's not America, you can format your dates differently. Um, you can even like do stuff with the size. So um, our size is really cool. It's like a class um, and it'll show like megabytes, gigabytes, et cetera. But they have all of this, like you're logging. Oh, we have such cool logging. It's like, it's like real professional. That was one of my favorite things ever was whenever I saw, I was like, wow, this looks like a real vendor did it. Um, so here, yeah, I talked to, oh, I love this. Okay, so a detached database is a database that you detach and then it just sits there on the disk, right? You didn't delete it. it you just you you unregistered it right so let's go ahead and do that we have like three minutes all right so i just created a bunch of databases how awesome is this by the way i created a bunch of databases and then i detached a bunch of databases we have uh, a command called find dba orphan file and what you can do is actually find all your orphan files. A lot of people are like, man, there's so SQL Server's taking up so much space, but my database is only three gigs. Um, and what happens is somebody detached a giant database and then forgot to remove it. So we have find DBA orphan file. This is very commonly used. So here we are going to, let's see, going to go there. Uh, I don't know if y'all use out variable. I love it. So what we're gonna do is select all of these and send it to the variable. These are all the detached. So these are all the ones that are found on disk in some default database uh, paths, um, but they aren't actually registered with the SQL server. So we're assuming we don't need them anymore. So let's go ahead and delete them. So I'm gonna put all of that um, in that out variable, right? Called Dell. So then I'm going to remove item. And then now I'm going to do Dell get child item. Oh, not found because it removed it. Sweet. Fast as heck. Super cool. Uh, CSVs. We're all um, 
All right, I got like one minute. I'll go real quick. I mean, this is lanyard. This is just some extra stuff that you might like because we kind of, you know, a lot of times we're told like, hey, can you put a CSV in a database? What if you could put like a whole directory full of CSVs in the database? You can using get child item, you uh, pipe that to import DBA CSV, and then you set the database name. You say auto create table. It'll get the table name from the CSV file. One of these is going to fail intentionally because um, I intentionally didn't format it right, and I wanted to show that we're very smart about the way that we process it. So you would actually need to specify the appropriate delimiter. But you could see here that you created this table. These are how many rows are copied. This is how much time was elapsed. And then here's to show that it actually worked. And we could see that uh, I started doing this a long time ago because at the time, Echo Smith Cool Kids was in style. So I like that. Oh, DBA processes. We love processes, right? Like how interesting is it that I can actually see on a busy server? This is really awesome. Um, you can see like the last query, you can see like what's going on. So it's kind of like top in Unix. If you use that, it's kind of like task control, task manager. Is that what it is? Yeah, task manager. We also have firewall commands and then got here, show them TDE. TDE is awesome. I don't have time to show you today. However, I do want to I do want to show you one final command that's awesome. Uh, so let's see. This is this is encrypting the entire the entire system. It's really awesome. It does everything. There's like a 57 step process to encryption, and you don't even have to worry about it anymore. This will do it all for you. Now all of the databases um, are encrypted except the, the system, and we have the thing called get DBA file where you can actually explore the remote system. And we could see that the file name, um, there are some backups there because when I encrypt this entire instance, this master key secure password and backup secure password are required. You have to back up your keys and your certs in order for this command to work. It's just an all-in-one. It's another combo kill that I'm super proud of. And that is all the time that I have today. Is there anyone with any questions? So we have newbie, new DB. You know what? I'm going to use this screen right here. Clear. Everybody see this? All right. We have some awesome commands for this new DBA uh, computer certificate. You can actually even use DBA tools to go to all of your computers and see which certificates are in, are. Um, expiring. So what you would do here is you would say computer name. I have SQL 01 and SQL 02. And then I would, I don't need to set the credential because I can log in. I don't need to set that because it'll figure it out. The cluster instance name is SQL cluster. So that'll create like the DNS for it. But if I want to, I can actually set the, set all of this. Uh, let's see, SQL cluster dot AD dot local. So this will actually create a computer certificate that is valid um, for SQL Server on the remote systems. And hopefully it works. I haven't tested it on a cluster in a long time, um, but there was like no way for me to easily do to easily do this without just running cert rec in the back. Um, but yeah, check that out. So now that I have this, I actually should have output the um, I should have output the variable to a variable, but uh, let's see, get DBA computer, certi uh, DBA computer certificate. Yeah, SQL instance, nope. Computer name, there we go, SQL 01. And you know what, it's on SQL 02 right now. So these shows you all the candidates. Um, let's select the last, let's see, uh, where name match SQL. Uh, select first one. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is pipe this to set DBA network certificate because like I had to name it that way. I'm so sorry. It's just, it's just the name. So it will go and it will set that. And this is doing it in the background. God, I love that. So you could see here, granted AD SQL server read access to the private key and replaced thumbprint. So it was already assigned and now it just has a new one. And then I, I could have probably uh, done it for SQL 01 as well at the same time. Let's try that again. Let's just see, Let's just see if it's going to work. 
I hope it does because then I'll just be like, holy shit, that's magic. Oh, it's only the first one. I don't know why. Okay, but, oh, because I said select first one. Dang it. You know what this is going to do? You know, I should do, hold on, wear thumbprint. Wear, wear thumbprint. Match. I could also specify the thumbprint. Um, where was the thumbprint? There we go. All right there. Let's see if this is going to work. Come on, do it. <laughs> yes, awesome. Thank you for the question because this is bomb as hell. This is so nice. So yes, we do support that. We do support that clustered instance. Uh, we can make your, your system like super secure with certificates at the network level, certificates um, in the actual database. It does like master and then it goes in and, and encrypts your databases as well, your users. Uh, sorry, user databases. And um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of certificate commands. This is how I explore DBA tools, um, get command module uh, DBA tools, and then I'll be like cert. And then look at that. So you see, we have all of these different, uh, oh yeah, you could, if you don't have access directly to your AD, which generates the certificate, you could just make a certificate signing request. Um, and then look how cool this is. You could do your certificate expiration. Look, it's like an Azure command with its super long name. All right, SQL01. No, why? <laughs> why did it, why did it not, why, what's going on? Man, I don't know what's happening here. I'm gonna do some verbose. I had to end on this note, verbose. Oh, interesting, I don't know. Let me try SQL CS. All right, never mind. I don't know what's going on there. I need to fix it. So, can somebody file an issue? I lie. Um, I will file an issue for that. Um, and I hope that answers your question. And if so, does anybody else have any questions? Did y'all find this useful as systems engineers? Heck yeah, sweet, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining. It has been a blast. This is one of my favorite sessions. Um, I mean, this is like the second time that I did, a, I did a practice round for a user group, but it really means a lot to me because I am a systems engineer um, and I am very excited to show y'all uh, just how powerful DBA tools is. It's like this perfect mixture of PowerShell. It's my, my two favorite things. Um, so thank you so much for coming to my presentation and I'm really glad that y'all found it.